that we are jars of clay that you have filled with the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are a storytelling God and you have been telling a grand story of grace since the beginning. So Lord, I pray that as we continue to worship you by opening up your word, that your grace would break us of ourselves and fill us with your spirit. In that spirit's power and in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray these things. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please have a seat. Good morning. You know, as Jesus was walking along with his disciples, he was asking them some questions and he says, so who do the people say that I am? And they say, well, some say Elijah and some say the prophet. And he turns and he asks them the question of life. But what say you? Not what do your parents say, not what do the the people around you say, not even what does your fellow disciple say, what do you say? And Peter pipes up and he says, you are the Christ, you're the Messiah, the one that's been told about from the very beginning. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, son of Jonah. Because my father has revealed, this is evidence of my father's work in your life. And he says, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What is the rock that he's building his church upon? It is the truth that he is the fulfillment of the message of the gospel. He is saying all of the stuff that you guys have ever learned and seen and saw and sung for for centuries is coming true in me. And that's what we get to look at today. So I'm excited for that opportunity. Guys, my job is to feed you the word of God. Right? And not just on Sundays, but whether it's in the daily devotionals that we email out or the daily readings that Dave mentioned or in the toolkit, it's, it's, we want to be a people of the word. And that's my job. But my goal is that you would be self-feeders that you would have a desire and a hunger and then even know how to come to his word expecting it to speak to you. And that's really part of what this series is about. In addition to just exalting God for who he is, it is helping us become better disciples so that we can become better disciple makers. And that cannot happen apart from the word of God. So I would just so encourage you to be in God's word every day. Today's message is the gospel of grace. It's a pretty simple title, the gospel of grace. And and my desire is that I would show you the gospel maybe in a way that you have not seen it before. So with that, open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Some of you are like, wait, where's he going? We're supposed to be in Ephesians, and we'll get there. But in Genesis chapter 1, should be easy to find. It's the first book, probably one of the first few pages of your Bible, Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 1. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's Genesis 1 1. That's how God chooses to start his story. He just starts out, In the beginning, me. In the beginning, I am. He is not running for God. He is not trying to win us over as he might be the, the, the one true God. He is just saying, I am. And that's all he has ever said. In the beginning, God. And then he proceeds in the rest of that chapter to speak creation into existence. And then he speaks male and female into existence. In the likeness of God, he created them, male and female. And then he puts them in a garden. And sometime during that time in Genesis chapter, between Genesis 1 and Genesis 3, Lucifer rebels. He's one of the created beings, an angel, who rebels and is sent down to the earth. And he wanders into the garden. And so we're going to pick it up in Genesis 3, starting in verse 8. He says, They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden on the cool of the day. The man and his wife and themselves were in the presence of the Lord. And God was among the trees in the garden. And then, I'm sorry, you know what? Let me back up and I'm going to start in verse 6. I'm like, because that's not really going to help tell the whole story. So in verse 6, it says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, 
and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave it to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they, were, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together to, and to make themselves loin coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he, God, said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? So here's what happens. The enemy comes to Adam and Eve and the way he still comes to us today. And the first thing he does is he questions God. All right, he says, did, did, God, did God really say this? Now he says to us, does God's word really mean this? And then the second thing he does is he says, the reason God doesn't want you to eat this true fruit is because you'll be like him. And he comes to us with idol worship. And in this particular case, it's the biggest idol we have, and that's the idol of self. And so Eve eats, and Adam eats, and yet, here's the beauty of this picture. Immediately, they have rebelled against God. There is now, where they were walking along, shoulder to shoulder with God, for we don't really know exactly how long this was, but in the presence of God, for the first time in their lives, they are naked. That means out from under the protection of God. For the first time in their existence, they are no longer under his protection. And their immediate response is to try to fix it themselves by putting some leaves together for clothing. Because they don't know what else to do. And here comes God. And here's what's interesting. God doesn't pound them. He parents them. Right? He doesn't yell at them. He calls to them. He doesn't say, what, he doesn't say, I don't pay, it didn't go down like this. Did you eat that fruit that I told you not to eat? He's like, who told you that you were naked? How did this happen? Because he wants them to think about it. Because we stepped away from you and sin entered the world. And because of what happened in that moment, at that time that we just read, we have all been infected. All of us have been infected with sin. And sin leads from that moment on, the world, the universe, everything in it began to do something it had never done. Die. Decay started. But God was not shocked. He was not up in heaven going, Oh no, what am I going to do now? Because he had planned this out from before the foundation of the world. And what I love about this scene and why I wanted to start here is because God, our God, has always ever been a seeking and saving God. From the very beginning, he comes to them. He doesn't wait for them to come to him. And even when he does come to them, he comes to them in grace. Because you know what he does? He slaughters an innocent animal to cover them with clothes that will really work because that's just who he is. So today's question, in light of that, guys, in light of that reality of, of the fact that we have a Savior who seeks and saves that which is lost, here's the question. How do we see and share the gospel? How do we see and share the gospel? Guys, if we don't understand that we have a problem, if we don't understand that there's a problem that needs to be fixed, then there's no reason for Jesus. And the problem with the gospel today, the way it's being proclaimed in most churches, is that we skip the problem and we go right to the good news. Well, how is good news good news unless there's some bad news to make it good against? If you don't think you're a sinner, why would you need a savior? So the gospel of who Jesus is makes absolutely no sense to most of the world because most of the world believes we're just better than that dude. So I am okay. The problem is that dude that we're being compared against is perfectly holy. And the only way we can be in his presence is if we are made perfectly holy. So with that, let's turn... 
to Ephesians chapter 2 and look and see how Paul tells us that happens. Ephesians is, you're going to go all the way to the other end of your Bible, basically. You're going to go past all the um, um, Gospels. You're going to go past Acts, past Romans, past the two big letters of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And then the letters start getting short. And this is a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, which is in what is now modern-day Turkey. And, and we're going to look at... Um, the gospel. He, he shares the gospel in these 10 verses we're going to look at as clearly as he shares it in any place in scripture. And so we're going to take a few minutes and look at what he tells us. And the first thing that he's going to point out and where we, why we started in Genesis is he's going to say we need to see the need. So look in verses, chapter 2 verses 1 through 3. He says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working on the sons of disobedience. Now get this, church, church us. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Now guys, in this culture that we live in today, that, is, that, that, that even words are considered abusive and harsh, and, and, and we're, we know, but we, any word that does not affirm us is, is somehow like, that is, that is wrong. We read a word like, and we are children of wrath, and we see wrath and God's wrath, and we think, oh my goodness, how can a loving God be wrathful? And yet, if you step back and you think about it, we want him to be. Right? I've talked about this many times. You don't want a judge in a courtroom that, that lets a rapist come up and say, you know what, just because I love you so much, I'm going to let you get away with it. We wouldn't like that. Now you expand that to the, to the magnitude that is a completely holy God and go, what is he supposed to do? He didn't cause them to sin. He, didn't, he doesn't cause us to live. He tells us, you are dead. Not a little bit dead, you are completely dead. Not almost dead, entirely dead. And here's what dead looks like. You're a sinner, a trespasser. You followed the course of this world. You were, you were living in the way of the world. You were following, and, and without even knowing it most of the time, because he's so clever, you were following the prince of the power of the air. Who is that? Satan. Satan. He said, without even knowing it, you are being lured in by the enemy, by Satan. And this, this has caused you to live in the lust of the flesh. Guys, and that's not just sexual lust. Hey, that, that's anything that we crave. And then he says, and you by nature were children of wrath. And he's talking about us. We too. We, the church, were this. So rather than look outside of these walls at a world that's going to hell and going, oh, how can they be that way? Let us continually remind ourselves that apart from the, what we're going to look at here in a second, apart from what he's about to turn, turn to in a second, we are them. But God, we'll get there in a minute. Guys, unless you come to Christ knowing that you're a sinner, you probably have not come to Christ. Now, young people in this room, I want you to look at me. Look at me, and this isn't just for you. Old people in this room look at me too, but young people, look at me right now. Guys, if you're sitting in this room right now, it is probably because you were raised in a home that professes faith in Jesus Christ, and don't ever stop praising God for that. I was not, and there is damage in my past that still the enemy still uses in my life, but don't sit here and go, man, I wish I had an awesome testimony like Pastor Doug or like the testimonies you're going to hear today during baptisms, because then I'd really get, guys, praise God that you have been raised in a home that is protecting you, but... Young people, look at me. You are not saved because your parents are protecting you. You are not saved because you live in a Christian home. You are only saved one way, and that is through the grace of Jesus Christ. And it is so hard for people that were raised in good homes to see, wow, I really need grace. I, it, it's almost, in some ways, it's almost harder for you and for those of you that are older, but were raised by, but were privileged to be raised by God-fearing Christian parents, it's almost harder for you because you go, you know what? I, I I've just raised, been my whole life. I've always been kind of okay. It's because we compare ourselves to the wrong person. We have all been infected, and there is only one antidote, and that's Jesus Christ. And that brings us to our next point. 
Look at verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Guys, but God. How could two little words mess me up? Because they mean everything. But God. Because this is why I started in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God. We have to start with him because the gospel starts with him. But God. Do you get that? Do you understand that your salvation has nothing to do with you and everything to do with him? But God. Because the reason we, here's why we jump past those two little words, other than that they're just two little words, is because the rest of that passage is about us. So we want, to, we want to get past that part and see how he just, yeah, but God, it's like, it's like a kid going, okay, but, but what's, what's in it for me, dad? And, so, and, and he says some really wonderful things. He has made you alive. He has raised you up. He has seated you in the heavenly places. These are some really cool things. And oh, by the way, guess what, guys? They're all past tense. They are all already done. Now you're like, yeah, but I'm sitting here on this uncomfortable bench where when the person next to me moves, I feel it. I get that. You're not seated in that. Right now, from his point of view, we, we live in the tension of the already accomplished. We have been raised up. We have been brought to life. We have been seated. And the not yet of it hasn't been fully consummated because Christ has not come. But he sees us that way. Anyway, Paul very specifically in the language he wrote this in is saying, this has already been done and there's nothing you can do to take it away. Praise Jesus for that. And next week when I teach on the sovereignty of God in Psalm 115, we're going to praise him for the truth that he is all-powerful. But guys, don't lose sight of this. Why did he do it? Why did he do it? Rich in mercy because of his love for us. Guys, God loves you. Amen. God loves you. He is all-powerful. He is holy. He is a, 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 a righteous judge. And he is a completely loving father. And that is such a hard thing for me to grasp. Depending on how you were raised and who you were, and, and who, like, it's, it's so, guys, you have got to remind, guys, everybody say this with me. God loves me. Say it again. God loves me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whomsoever would believe in him would not perish, but pass from death to life. It's what Paul's talking about right here. You were dead, but you were made alive. How? Because God is a loving God. And we have to rehearse that. We have to repeat, because guys, the world is trying to tell you that love looks completely different. The world is trying to tell you that, that you are unlovable unless you do X, Y, and Z. And so we start to think, God, I must be unlovable because I'm not doing what you tell me. Guys, his love is unconditional. It's what makes grace, grace. Young people, look at me. Guys, you do not do so that it will be done to you. You don't do for God so that he will save you. It has been done to you if you're his, so now you do. That's the difference. Because he loved you, it's been done to you. Completely apart from you, having nothing to do with you. Not because of anything you do or don't do, not because of anything you are or are not, and there is such freedom in that. Man, we need to embrace the grace of God. Not just acknowledge it. Man, we need to dive in, feet first, bask in it, never leave. Look at Ephesians 2, 8, 8 and 9. 
This is our memory verse. So every week in the toolkit, there's a memory verse. I'm not sure if we haven't really talked about that much, but at the beginning of each section, this is this week's memory verse. It's also on the front of your bulletin. Um, so we try to put it in front of you. I'm, one, I'm curious how you're doing with that. I would encourage you to, to memorize scripture because the Holy Spirit will use it in moments like Rhonda talked about to bring it to mind and bring it to bear in freakish ways that you have, you're not even thinking of. You're like, why would I memorize this verse? And then a week later, you're like, oh, now I see why I memorized that verse. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not of yourselves. It is a gift of God that no one would boast. As all, he's really, all Paul's really doing here is he's saying, in case you didn't get it in verses 1 through 7, I just want to let you know something in these two verses. It's all God. Because get this. Here's what pops in the original in the Greek. When he says, by grace you have been saved, and I don't want to be a pastor that's doing word studies, but, I, but, I, but this one's important. For by grace you have been saved. It is in the perfect tense and the passive voice. Here's what that means. Perfect tense. It has been accomplished. And Paul could have written, these are very rarely used in Paul's writing. So when Paul uses this form of the Greek, he is doing it on purpose to make a point. He's saying, for by grace you have been saved. Perfect tense. Once for all time. It happened in eternity past. It's good forever. There's nothing you can do about it. And it's in the passive voice. That means you sat there and did nothing. That means you were the dead corpse on the floor and God did CPR on you if you're his. Do you partner with someone who's doing CPR with you? No, because they'll probably punch you in the face. Like, what, are you just kidding being dead so that I could have to put my mouth on your mouth? What's the deal? Although I guess we don't do that anymore, right? I don't know. But <laughs> The point is, the Bible is very specific on purpose. And the beauty of grace is that it's not about us. It's all about a God that loves us. Here's what grace looks like. If you want to know how much sin hurts God, look at the cross and see his son dying for the sins of the world. That is what the free gift of grace cost God. That is what love looks like. How do we know when we really get grace? Because how do we know when we really understand? I don't mean have it applied to us. I mean, how do we know we really understand grace? When we, re when we start living our lives for someone bigger than us. When we start living our lives for the one who gave us the grace. When we start living our lives for the long-term eternal significance and not the short term. That's how we know we really get grace, when our salvation is no longer about us. Guys, I, last, about a year ago, I guess, we, a group of us went up to the Grand Canyon to do a hike. It was the second one we had done. It was, a, it was a great experience, although it was 27 degrees that morning when we got up, so my wife was really happy about that. And, but we get, we get to the rim of the Grand Canyon, we're getting ready to hike down, and every now and then I would stop and just share a little bit about God and creation and how the Grand Canyon got to be formed. But guys, none of us stood on the rim of the Grand Canyon and, taught, and then went, yeah, that's cool. Now let me tell you how awesome I am. Can I just share with you something about how great I am? We don't, we don't do that. Why don't we do that? Because when you're standing in front of something awesome, you don't talk about you. Right? When, when, when we realize how awesome our salvation is, because of how amazingly awesome our God is, we don't talk about us. We talk about him. That's gospel doctrine. Gospel doctrine is simply, that we, we hold to a gospel doctrine here. God saves sinners. We were dead, he makes us alive, that's the gospel. Now that gospel doctrine should be creating a gospel culture in our midst, and that's how Paul finishes up. So today when I ask the question, how do you see and share the gospel? We need to see the need, we need to embrace the grace, but then how do we know that we really are, are buying into this? It's because we live outwardly and upwardly. We live out the gospel outwardly and upwardly. And with the time I have left, I'm going to point those two things out. Look at Ephesians 2.10. He says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand 
so that we would walk in them. There's a lot of theology there that I'm not even going to get into because it's not really, it doesn't, it's just, here's the deal. You're, when it says workmanship, it means a thing created. You are his creation for a reason. He saved us on purpose, not an accident, once for all time, for a purpose. That's what Paul is driving it back to. Okay, this is beautiful. This is grace. You were dead. You were made alive. Now here's our role. Here's what we do. What do you, so what? Like, what, what do we do about that? He's bringing it back to the reason God made us alive. Guys, God did not give you eternal life and leave you in a cemetery. He didn't save you so that you could just sit and mope around. He lifted you up to sit you on the throne with his victorious son. Guys, here's, here's what I think really we, we need. We, collectively, because there's a, there's a collective awe problem. And one of the awe problems we have is that we don't, we're not in awe of how, um, how much bigger our salvation is than even just us. Look at, turn, turn one page to chapter 3. Well, for me, it's one page. Chapter 3, verse 10. I'm going, to, I'm going to start in verse 8. So in, 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 Ephesians, in Ephesians 2, what, our Ephesians, what Paul's doing is in, in chapters 1 and 2, he's outlining the whole gospel. And then in chapter 3, he starts to wrap it up. And at the end, and at this section I'm going to read, this is sort of his wrap up right here. And look at what he says in verse 8 of chapter 3. To me, the very least of all saints, the grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery, which for ages has been hidden in God, whom created all things. Here's all he's saying. He's saying, God gave me the message to, to tell the world, not just the Jewish people, to tell the world that all of this is about him and about Jesus Christ and about grace and salvation. That's what he's saying. Now get this, though. This is the important part. Look. Hang with me. So that. Well, those are always important two little words there. So that. Here's the purpose. Here's why, not just the purpose of those two verses I read, the purpose of the whole letter so far, the gospel. So that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the, through the church, this collective witness through the church, to the rulers and the authorities in the world. Is that what it says? That's what you think it should say, right? Like, isn't that what, like we're supposed to be a lighthouse for the gospel to the world. Absolutely we are. And there's lots of places in here where we could turn and see that. Let your light shine before men. Right? The world. Paul's, Paul, is, Paul is exploding the purpose of our salvation. And I don't mean exploding getting rid of. I mean expanding it to the edges of the universe in a realm we can't even see. He's saying so that the wisdom of the grace of God can be shown to the angels and the demons. Because that's how important your salvation is. That's how much it's not about us. We are teaching heavenly beings and hellish figures what grace looks like. Because they don't get it. Only we do. We got to get a bigger picture of the God we serve. We got to live for something bigger than you and, and for something longer than this life. Okay, so real quick, give me something to do here. Guys, here's the thing. Our salvation is not about self-esteem. It's not about self-worth. It's not about self-fees, right? It's not, Jesus put self in front of one word. What was it? Denial, death, self-denial. So how do we do that? How do we live in a way where people will see his glory? Three really quick things. One, meet needs. Like, like look for people that are hurting today at the fellowship meal. Look for people that are hurting emotionally, people that are hurting spiritually, people that are in need physically. Great opportunity for the gospel there. We are his workmanship. How do we work it out? How do we live outwardly? Upwardly, we're just to be loving each other. Showing the angels what grace looks like. Outwardly, live it out. How are we living it out? Meet people's needs. Second, ask questions. For Pete's sake, smile. Just smile. 
And watch and see if you don't walk into a coffee shop like Pete did and have somebody go, I think you're a believer. Can you please pray for me? Watch, just watch and see what he does. And then share his word. Right, share his word. Don't preach his word, just share it. Right, in, in, your, in your bulletin, we've been running these for a few weeks, but there's, they're back in here today. There's extras on the, on the um, connect table in the back, but there's these cards. This week, they're yellow. It talks about ask. Ask questions. Admire. So- rather than jump right into, once they start telling you what their thinking is, rather than jumping right to, well, here's why that's wrong. Let me tell you what's right. Admire something about it. Just say, man, you know, I think it's, I think it's cool that you're trying to find out what the truth is. I think it's great that you're trying to live a life that is pleasing to your parents. Just if that was what the conversation was about. But then admit. But you know what I found out? I found out no matter how hard I try, I can't. And that's why I thank God for Jesus Christ. I'll keep trying, because he tells me to, by his strength. But in those moments when I can't, I praise him for Jesus Christ. Admit. Guys, watch and see what happens when you, when you approach people. Rather than in a judgmental way, approach them with, man, I am a sinner. And I, ne- I, I needed a Savior, and I have one, and his name is Jesus Christ. Can I show you? Can I show you? As we take a minute now and, and just sort of reflect on what all of this means, and the lights come down, the music team's going to come up. There's a spot on the back of your connecting points for responding to his will. Just what does he want you to do with all of this? Guys, don't walk out of here the same way you walked in. Right, don't just go, okay, that was great. I've heard that before. Or, guys, there, there's a purpose and a plan. for Nobody is here by accident. We are all here by divine appoint, appointment today. But I want to encourage you Guys, if, if what you're walking out of here with is, okay, here's what, yeah, I, I need to do better. Like, I, I need to get better. I need to do better. I need to, I, need to, I need to be sharing the gospel more, and I need to be more like Rhonda, and I need to be more like what, whatever. The, guys, you're not hearing what I'm saying. You're not hearing it if that's what you're thinking. Guys, any motivation that appeal, appeals to your will will fail and just leave you very frustrated. Don't walk out of here today having heard a message of it's all God and then, go, and then walk out like I tend to do over and over again so I better go do something. Wait, what? Wait, what? <laughs> it's all God. It's just all God. Let's pray. So Father, I thank you, Lord, for the truth of those two little words, but God. I don't know why. I know why those words mess me up. Because I feel so undeserving. But I am. And it doesn't matter. That's the beauty of the gospel. The beauty of the gospel is that you did for us what we could not do. It's not about what we deserve. It's about what you want to give. And you want to give life. You came and died that you might give life abundantly. Father, I pray that as we continue to worship you today, you would continue to press the gospel into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.